Okay, good morning. Um, can you tell us your full name? Webb Nash Morrison. Okay, all right. Welcome, Webb. When and where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York on June 12th, 1926 uh, on the top of a steamer trunk in the back bathroom of a brownstone in the bed section. Of Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. All right. Simply because my mother happened to be there at the moment. Uh -huh. I grew up in Sable. When did, you, when did you relocate from Brooklyn out to Sable? Shortly after you no, were born? No, I just... always lived here. So you just uh, happened my, to be in Brooklyn. That was my grandparents' house. <laughs> Brooklyn. So you just happened to be there and that was the day my that you should be born. Be That's right. <laughs> Oh, that's a great story. Good. All right. So you were you were born in a brownstone in Brooklyn. Great. Uh, well, what are your family's origins? My great grandfather was Andrew Morrison, who came over from Ireland in about 1847. Mm -hmm. He was a laborer. Mm. His wife was Mary Jane Elliott. Uh, whether they were married before or after he got here, I'm not sure. Mm. Uh, she also was from Ireland. Mm -hmm. On my mother's side, my grand, great grandfather was Webb Nash, who also came from Ireland. Mm. Uh, and uh, his, my gr grandfather was Joe. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting too far back. Yeah, no, no. My, my Webb Nash, my great grandfather was Joseph Mason Nash, his son. Okay. And then my grandfather was J. Webb Nash. Uh, my father was G. Elliot Morrison, as you know, and uh, my boyfriend. Okay. Where, um, do you know awfully, like, or roughly where in Ireland they were from? Are they? The North, I think. Mm. Uh, that's, okay. that's a project for, I know some of the counties. Right. Yeah. One is County Antrim, which I think is in the Northeast, but okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. So, since they, they came from Ireland, uh, where, did, where did your relatives then settle here in the U.S.? Did they settle right in Sable? No, they were all in, in, the, in the city. Okay. Uh, the Morrisons uh, grew up in Greenpoint around Java Street. Mm -hmm. The Nashes were in Brooklyn for most of the time, although they were for a time up in Mount Vernon, New York. And they came back to Brooklyn about 1911. Uh, and we're in Brooklyn after that. What what was their trade? My great my grandfather, my great grandfather, as I said, was a laborer. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a had a construction company. Did a, built a lot of houses and mm. apartments in Brooklyn. Really, he was also a Brooklyn alderman. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, also organized and was one of the directors of the Greenpoint Savings Bank in 1912 and he was president there until 1915 after he moved out to Sable permanently around 1920 uh, he was an organizer and director of the Community Trust Company which was later absorbed by across the street by the Oysterman's Bank uh, he also started to build the Cedar Shore Bought the Cedar Shore property in 1913, built the first hotel in 1917, and that burned down before it opened. And the second one was built in 1924. And of course, he was a hotel man. And mm -hmm. He was uh, assisted by his son, my father, George Elliott, who mm -hmm. went by the name Elliott, and my aunt, who was Jeanette. Mm -hmm. who also was a buyer for the hotel, and my mother, who was at the hotel. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, well, uh, adding to my, my father, he was originally an engineer. He had a patent on some gas machines. Uh, he was with the Breeze Aircraft Country Company during the First World War and designed a trainer, which the Army Air Corps used, and Breeze wrote a letter to the government saying, don't take him uh, because we need him here. <laughs> and I have a copy of that letter. However, the government wouldn't have taken him anyway because he was born with nine toes instead of ten. And that disqualified him. After that, uh, he, he was 
not only the hotel owner and manager at my grandfather died, but he was also active in, in the Long Island Association. He was one of the organizers of the local Rotary. Uh, he uh, was on the school board, uh, various other community activities. Uh, on my mother's side, my grandfather was a, black, a vice president of Black Star and Frost in New York, especially with Pearls. Uh, and my mother, of course, was, his daughter was active in local affairs like the uh, Village Improvement Society, mm -hmm. the Garden Club, and so forth. Well, we never, we never went too far away. We had some, uh, the trip to the city was a big deal. And, and my grandparents had the city house until 43. They moved out here when they moved out here permanently, but they've been coming. Both grand grandparents had come to Sable earlier on. The Marsons started coming to Sable with George Alexander, and I have a picture of my, they went to Blue Point first, and then they came to Sable, and went to at the South Bay House, which was at the foot of Candy Avenue. And I have a picture of my grandmother's birthday party at the South Bay House in 1903. And then it was 1913 when my grandfather decided to buy the Powell property and uh, develop it uh, with cottages and a hotel. But it was he did not finally move everything out of Brooklyn until 19, around 1920. Because he was Brooklyn Alderman from 19, and he was president of the Green Stop Point Bank from 1912 till, if I remember, 1915, mm. and he was still an alderman in there in the early teens. And uh, then when he came out here, he devoted almost all his time to save him. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we were, and the resort. The resort hotel business was much bigger than, as I said yes. in the Cedar Shore history, it was big through the 20s. Of course, the second Cedar Shore didn't get built until 1924. Mm. And then in the 30s, when the Depression came and started to peter off, it was still reasonably good. Mm. But, by, but then the war wiped it all out. People, uh, they went maybe to the Hamptons or they went to the Jersey Shore where I worked during the war, the summer of 42, as I mentioned, I was in Spring Lake as a waiter, room service waiter at the Monmouth Hotel. Uh, and after the war, it never came back here. It came back to Fire Island to an extent. Interesting. And to the Hamptons where people went out there, but not to, not to mid or western Suffolk. Interesting. So the war really had an impact. That really changed yeah. Sable's landscape. Yeah, it did. You know? Wow. And of course, there weren't any hotels here because the, the Cedar Shore became uh, the home base for the Tribune Fresh Air Fund uh -huh. from 42 to 46, where they had 14 to 16 year old girls down there every summer, lots of 150 for two weeks. They mm -hmm. had about 600 girls a summer. Uh, and the girls, uh, sort of, most of them were poor girls from. from New York City, mm. and when they found themselves in two to a room with their own, each with his own bed or her own bed, mm. and a private bath, to, for two of them, they were, some of them were overwhelmed. If yeah. You read some of the accounts. Then, of course, in '46, in the winter of '46, the Tribune decided to sell it and move on to Connecticut, mm. and so they sold it and reopened in '47. And from what I can read in the Suffolk County News and mm. so forth, the local part of the Cedar Shore, the events, the, the dinners, the yacht club dinners, uh, the uh, political dinners, mm. uh, the card parties from the St. Lawrence Church, and the bingo parties and all these others, went on through from 47 through 52. But I don't think the hotel probably ever came back to itself. It had its trouble. It was open. It had four different names in that time. Uh, it was uh, initially in '47. It became the Sable Manor Beach Club, 
when it changed hands again in 53, it became the Sable Hotel and Beach Club. And when it changed hands again in 55, it became the Shore Club. And then I think when it, it eventually became the Bayview Plaza, probably 56 or 57, but I don't know that because not that that most recent history yeah. is yet to be discovered. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Sable back then? As you as you grew up, Sable was much less crowded than it is now. Okay, good. Uh, All right. The mo many of the houses were boarded up in the, f in the uh, fall and opened again in the spring. Nowadays, sometimes with pe they're open, people keep summer houses open till Christmas, and then they trip. Sure. But in those days, after September, they were gone from the local. But, uh, I grew up, our house was on Cedar Shore property, which is on Lower Handsome Avenue. Mm -hmm. Across the street was the Simmons Estate with a sunken rose garden, which I could get up and see every morning from my bedroom. I could hear the oyster boats going out at 5 o'clock in the morning because they carried right over from West Sable. It was not all, there were not all the houses in, this, in the in, uh, Palmer Drive, yes. those streets in Lower Sable, that was all barren sand mm -hmm. in those mm -hmm. days. And so you could, the sound carried very well across. Uh, I went to Sable High School, I started kindergarten with Miss Edwards, who was the teacher in old 88. And actually I went through from the first to the eighth grade all in old 88. The junior high was in the in the center section of the, of the building, with, which connected to uh, front and back tees. Uh, and during the war, or during the early part of the war, in 1941-42, the tower of Old 88 was the highest on Long Island. And we used to go up there, we volunteered to go up there in shifts and watch for German aircraft, which thankfully never appeared. And, uh, and, uh, all of the community participated, our kids, adults, everybody, just like they did in the 90s after the fire. We had the fire patrol going around at night. Uh, I was then a, a member of Boy Scout Troop 12 mm -hmm. at St. Anne's Church, where Joe Bond was the rector. I was also went to Episcopal Sunday School. Actually, in those days, we didn't have to hang out at night. We stayed home and did our homework. And, wasn't any place to hang out anywhere. Everything closed probably by seven o'clock at the latest. We went out for dinner. We went to the Golden uh, Golden something. They sold antiques and it was also a restaurant. We also went for dinner at the Kensington Hotel where you get a full meal, full dinner for 75 cents. Uh, now where was the Kensington located? In? Right where Sable, Sable Cleaners and the Delicatessen are now Carvel mm -hmm. at the moment. So the uh, northeast on the corner, corner of, you know, of Railroad Avenue and uh, Main Street, uh -huh. and of course next to was Gerber's department store, which is a big four-story department store, which, if I recall, became the first King Kong, and then was torn down. And of course there we had Montauk Highway and Middle Road, but in those days they were known as the North Road and the South Road. Huh. Huh. And, it was still a crossing guard where the bridge is now to slow you down on your way to Patchor. Uh, uh, we walked to school or we rode bikes. There were no bus transportation. Because uh, we lived at the, uh, in what is now 299 Handsome Avenue. It did burn in the late 90s, but it was rebuilt pretty much from the front as it used to look. Mm. Uh, it's been extended in the back, but mm -hmm. pretty much in the back. Uh, all kids had a boat. Well, you pretty much had a boat. That, and in the summertime, and my father built my first eight-footer, which was, uh, I got when I was eight years old. Then in two years later, I got a pea pod, what was called a pea pod, which I bought secondhand, Dipsy Doodle. And then, uh, then in 38, I graduated to a Comet, and we had, in the wet pants at that time, we had a snipe class and a Comet class, and a 
Cape Cod class and the Star class, and most of the rest of them, as you may find from Todd Travis' book, are handicap classes. And my comet was buried in the sand at the foot of Handsome Avenue in the hurricane of 38. And so the next year I bought a town class, and there, there, that became a, a class in the wet pants for mm -hmm. some years. Mm -hmm. They were nice boats. They were like the Cape Cod. They were about the same size, about 17, 18 feet. Mm -hmm. But the wet pants was big when it got organized in the 30s. And of course, the handicap classes included all sorts of boats, mm -hmm. all sorts of things that floated. And <laughs> everybody belonged to it. Mm -hmm. they, although they had some of their events at Sea to Shore, their main headquarters was always the Shoreham. Uh, race week, which was all the yacht clubs around the bay, which generally happened in August, usually came to Sable for a couple of races of the larger boats, and that was usually in August. Though. But the wet pants went on all season. And they, they're still going, and all that would be bigger, I don't think, that they had in those days. Mm. Mm. And, uh, Saturday afternoon were racing days. Really? Triangular course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So everyone had a boat, and that's uh, pretty much that was the that's thing. pretty much how you well, passed well, your time. You don't see nowadays. You go down the bay in, in the summertime and you to look far and wide to find a boat. But in those days, everybody had a boat. Well, we get they got more expensive, difficult to keep up. I mean, I kept mine in Browns River across from Captain Marks at the foot of Terry Street and I had to roll over then because that was all marshland over there mm. on Rayport side. Now, of course, the town has built docking there, but yeah. that was buried in the marshes of Bayport. You couldn't get there from McConnell or Sea Avenue. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was pretty open country. Well, the summer, the, the summer memories, of course, at the hotel were yeah. always a uh, point of interest. I used to put out a weekly newspaper now Did you? when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. Really? Uh, talking about some of the more prominent guests, the governor of Rhode Island or someone like that, who were citing guests, most of whom came from Brooklyn, but some from northern New Jersey, East Orange particularly, and the Orange, not East Orange, but the Oranges particularly. Uh, and of course, they were, after the hotel closed, which was usually early the week after Labor Day, Sable died for the season. What was that like? As you, it oh, was very nice and peaceful. Uh huh. <laughs> the local uh, people and the, the main street quieted down. Uh, of course, we didn't. There weren't big sales and things in those mm. days like you have nowadays. Certainly weren't malls. I mean, right. You were closer to Main Street. Mm. And the town was tighter knit, mm -hmm. closer to those that were left for the, for the winter time. And as you say, you rode your you know, bike to school, or you walked to school, or in the snow, or occasionally we went to the city to visit the grandparents. But that was a two hour drive on a two lane road in yeah. those days. It's not like it is today, right? Because uh, Montauk Highway wandered its way down through Freeport and on into the, into the city, and of course, a lot of Bayport. We used to go ice skating over there, Beeman's Pond, which was off Seaman Avenue to the west, and Fortescue's Pond, or the uh, uh, or the Mill Pond, which mm -hmm. of course still exists. Sure. But it was pretty much more outdoor stuff. The kids nowadays, I don't think, do things outdoors. Some of them do. No, not the a whole ball lot games, anymore, yeah. tennis, but the, sure. uh, there was more outdoor stuff in those days. Winters were a lot heavier then in the snow. And I mean, they used to land little planes on the bay. They used to drive cars over to Fire Island. Uh, Fire Island was less developed then. You didn't have, for example, the pines mm -hmm. to us as kids was Fisherman's Pass. Okay. That's what it was. It was marked by a white a white cross on the shore. And we would sail over there. We would anchor in our 17 or 18 or 20 foot sailboats. Uh, and we would walk through to the 
there were no houses. Yeah. You'd walk through the path to the, the ocean side and went swimming. Yep. Come back to the clay bay side and dig clams with our feet. We would sleep on this on our on our boats or on the beach overnight, stay overnight. My father had a power boat in those days and he used to keep it in the water till November. Oh wow. So that we could go over to Fisherman's Pass and cut holly. Oh wow. Oh. At that time. <laughs> uh, we explored some of the old estates around here then, which were just to some extent abandoned like Pepperidge Hall down in Oakdale. Really? Which is where the was where the WRC is nowadays. Uh, I mean, they had a big ice house there and, and the ruins of the, of the main building, which had, I believe burned down. So mm. uh, Havemeyer's book, I'm sure, covers that in much more detail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, West Sable was uh, a little more, or it was less a part of Sable, perhaps, than it was now. Because really? When you were in school with West Sable kids, uh, they talked English, but when they went home to West Sable, they talked Dutch. Ah. And they, they, it, was a, it was a foreign, it was foreign territory. Very interesting. Close to the Dutch, two churches had services in the Dutch language in those days. I don't know if any do anymore. Uh, Sable School is a little more diverse too, then, because after the high school was built, the high school had buses that ran to bring kids from Oakdale, Bohemia, Holbrook, and Bayport, and, oh. Ron, and Ron Conkham. Oh, wow. And all of those kids came to school in those days. Mm -hmm. And the graduating class of 42 was probably made up of a great number of 101 were not from Sable, they were from these Interesting. other towns. There were several differences about the schools in those days. I can't remember whether it was Sable or East Islip, but my father also managed Timber Point Club from in 1934 and 35. In East Islip. I moved to Timber Point from Sable, and I went to the East Islip School. Huh. It was a terrible snowy winter. I know we were snowed in Timber Point for a week at one period. Wow. But in changing schools, either Sable or East Islip, and I don't know which one, the school year began in January. Wow. So okay. when I went to East Islip, I had to either go up a class or back a class. Oh, my. <laughs> and I went up a class. Yeah. So when I came back to Sable the next year, I either had to go up a class or back a class. Unbelievable. And I went up a class. So that's why I graduated from high school at 16, not because I was such a great student, but because the changes in the school systems uh, sure. forced you to do one or the other, and I did. Uh, sometimes I think maybe you learn more in those days than they may learn today. Anyway. Can you talk a little bit about what school was like at that point? Like, uh, what was a what was a typical classroom? Well, you minded like? the teacher. I mean, mm -hmm. nowadays, if somebody does some some infraction, the teacher's powerless to do anything. Right. They just go ahead and do it. I mean, we if we did anything bad, we were sent to Mrs. Schultz's office, which was on the back south end of the back uh, wing of Old Eighty Eight. Uh, Mrs. Schultz would take you down. Her husband was fire commissioner, she was the principal of the high school in those days, and uh, she, she had a pretty stern. Wow. Uh, I can remember a few of the teachers from elementary school who were, uh, what as I say, Miss Edwards and Mrs. Ennis, who I had in second grade. Her room was midway in the back way. And perhaps the reason I I remember Mrs. Ennis so well as when I was in Bombay in March of uh, 1946, uh, four, I'm sorry, of uh, 45, I, we were allowed to go up to the cricket club, the Bombay Cricket Club, and I was talking to a chap up there at the pool one day, uh, and he said, we got into this, where are you from, and so forth, and I said, Sable, New York. He said, 
oh, my aunt teaches school work. Mrs. Ennis's nephew. <laughs> and, uh, in, in junior high school, Mr. Lyons, who eventually married, I think her name was Miss Shirey, she was a French teacher. He was a junior in junior high. Uh, and, uh, and, and Henry Rogers taught history. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was in that school. In high school, I can remember a lot of them. Mrs. Berge, uh, Miss, Miss Knowles, Miss Edwards, uh, uh, Miss Heron, who was my home teacher in room 21 in Sable High School. Uh, that's. Uh, yeah. Now you've mentioned you've mentioned Miss Edwards a couple of times. What was well, Miss Edwards in, in kindergarten was she was Sarah Edwards. Okay. The old Edwards family. Go, I was going to uh, ask about uh, that. It was not. I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm not sure Miss, Miss Edwards. Maybe I'm mixing her up with someone else. Uh, -huh. uh In high school, but the one in. The one in kindergarten did not all of a sudden elevate the high school. Right, right. So there were two different ones, but the one in yeah. kindergarten yeah. was of the Edwards family. Of the Edwards family. Of yeah. Sable. Well, Main Street, a lot of the buildings are still there on Main yeah. Street, and a lot of them I still think of as, as their original tenants. Thornhill's Drugstore, uh, Beer's Confectionery used to be a school hangout when it, it's now, uh, it, it was the Runaway Bay Books. Now it's the uh, uh, it's in there. Now I'm trying to think the an an antique or something. Yes, I think antique yeah. Group. Uh, the uh, where the knitting shop is, of course, with the, with the chocolatier uh, uh, was the Priscilla Sweet Shop in those days. Ah. Uh, and we, that was another lunch place where we could go for lunch. Uh, Jim Fallon's family still had the fruit store, which was between Thornhills and uh, Beers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Putting them in the right perspective. Uh, where Jackie now has the general store was the Oysterman's Bank. As across the street, which is now vacant, was Violet's Blue. Yes. It was at one point a five and ten cent store. That was a community trust company. Originally, uh -huh. the post office building, which is where past and present is now, uh, was of course the post office. Miss Parks was one of the premier people in there running the place. Uh -huh. And Alston Croft later became postmaster. Uh, next to that were some buildings that I think burned. Uh, Leopards in that the rest of that block, uh, where you now have. Uh, Starbucks and the beauty store shop and so forth. That that block was Jesky's Hardware Store, uh, Leopard's Cigar Store, and, and magazines. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was in there. I can't think offhand. But yeah. Le Leopard's and, and uh, Jesky's Hardware Store. Were in there. Oh, I think Ehrenberg's drugstore was in there at one point. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, going the other way, of course, after you pass the community bank, Dickerson had his little yellow real estate office there, and then there was a driveway, and then you came to Juan's Bakery, which is now Cafe Joel. Okay. The middle store, I'm trying to think what the middle store was. But then you had H.L. Uh, uh, Terry and Sons Jewelers, hmm. uh, now where Relax a Back is. Yes. And uh, then you had on the corner of the Village Gas Station, which later became Cranberry uh, Bog. Yeah, was it the Cranberry uh, Patch or something like that? Cranberry Patch, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. So. Mm -hmm. And of course, around the corner, he, you have what used to be Fiala's paint store run by Joe Fiala, and now that building is uh, is uh, uh, Dorothy's jewelry store right. and others next door to it. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the street, you have the Kensington Hotel, 
and its bar was a, a outbuilding in back connected to it, but an outbuilding back running on Railroad Avenue. Mm -hmm. And beyond the Kensington, you had uh, Gerber's gar uh, department store, and then you had the Masons in the old church, and then of course you had the Sable's first schoolhouse before they built the fire new firehouse there in the, in the, in the mid thirties. Uh, the old firehouse had been right on on Main Street, uh, two doors up from Green Avenue, where uh, the lawyers are now. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, Next to the Capital House. One Bank. Mm -hmm. And everything where the where the Capital One is now, that, that was a two-story, a large two-story building, which was Jetlicas. They sold appliances, stoves, and refrigerators and things, and their apartment was on the second floor. And they lived on the second floor. And of course, you go up the street a little more, and you have the building, which is now got the shoe store in it. The building uh, going up from the firehouse, mm -hmm. uh, you got the modern diner, which to me I think has been there forever, but it was probably moved from farther back or something. I don't remember. And then you have the stretch uh, where the sh shoe store was. And the middle building and Bill's Barbershop is that yes. particular building. That's the old Pearl Hotel, which was set much farther back from the street, maybe back where the drive-in bank is now. Really? That far that back? Moved up to the main street huh. and converted to stores. And then there was a, uh, going on up the building, that there were a couple of buildings there which have burned out over the years. Got the new stores, and then you get to the Edwards building, which is, was AC Edwards, but now K. Cameron's. Yes. And next, then we're back to the bank again. Going down toward Handsome Avenue, uh, Rayner's Funeral Home was next to it. No, no, there are two buildings in there. One's now Hoax Insurance. I forgot who that was, but the other building was Rayner's original funeral, one of their Interesting. funeral homes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there was the Catholic Rectory, which was a great big building. And then St. Lawrence Church was very ornate. Yes. The Catholic Church on the corner. And across the street from there was an estate, which eventually became Prime Grove Restaurant, and was eventually demolished for the new church after St. Lawrence burned. Right. So, pretty much covers West Main Street, I think. Mm. Uh, mm. South Main Street hasn't changed too much until it burned, but it was rebuilt pretty much as it put things in the same place. So, yeah. Uh, I think that pretty much covers mm. Main Street. All right. Yeah. I know uh, there, where CVS in Sable is now, it used to be back in the 70s an A&P. That's right. Was it anything before the A&P? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. A&P was originally up in town where Connie's Lingerie is. Right? Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's what was in the middle store when I told you about Wands and Terry's. The middle store was Thomas Rolston, which was also a chain store. Ah, okay. Uh, in those days. And, of course, going down the other way, I digress here, Bohacks, one of the, one of the original Bohacks was where Main Street Carpet is now because Bohack lived in Bayport mm. and he was trying out his, in the early days of his stores that was one of the early ones and then that's why you've got Bohack Court yes, next right up there. on Greeley Avenue. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I think I recall stories about rolls from Juan's Bakery that uh, were they famous for White Mountain Rolls, perhaps? Or I, I do remember stories about that bakery and a couple of things that came from there that were well, particularly to, good. I don't remember any mm. specific okay. things that were good. They used to roast turkeys on Thanksgiving. Oh, people. really? I know that. Really? Uh, but they were, I think one of the ones, Margaret one, I think was in my class. How do you think that Sable is better now? Has it, has it improved, do you think, uh, and if so, in what ways? Well, there are more stores available. Uh, unfortunately, it still lacks a few things, like there's no men's store here, and no, uh, no longer is there any women's clothing store here. You've got probably too many gift shops. <laughs> 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 and antique shops, and, mm -hmm. and uh, 
home designers, interior directors. I think that's a shortcoming of the village at mm. the moment. Uh, but of course, it's got to be a much bigger town. And uh, I mean, what I was going up say was three thousand in the winter, maybe something like that. And now you're more like fifteen to seventy thousand all year round. So it's it's. It, Gotten much bigger. It's gotten much more active. Of course, when I was when I was a Boy Scout and uh, took my to be an Eagle Scout, you had to walk around Cockburn back, which was seven miles. Hmm. Uh, when you crossed over the railroad tracks uh, and passed the North Pole Bar, which was there to your left, uh, after that you were pretty much in pine scrub and sand all the way to Cockburn. Nothing in between. Uh, find anything. And, uh, now, of course, that area, as you know, is pretty much built up. Uh, the airport came in during the war, and, mm -hmm. and uh, then Sunrise and Dex got there later. But, uh, so it's, it's, it's much easier to go places. Places sure. are not as, quote, distant, unquote, as they used to be. Sure. Um, and transportation is better. Or much, uh, uh, although I say it's better, it really isn't uh, long distance transportation because trains take longer to get to Penn Station now than they did when I was. After my grandfather retired out here and used to go to, into the Black Star and Frost, uh, he used to try and get what they called in those days the Bankers Express, which okay. left New York at 420, and the first stop was Sable, and it got here. I'm sorry, I left New York at 4.30, and it got here at 5.40, an hour and 10 minutes. There are no trains that make it from here to New York in an hour and 10 minutes. Now, if you look back, in, even in the 1800s, some of the trains were faster than they are now. You didn't have as many commuters uh, as, you, yeah. as you did then. You had more commuters, perhaps, in the summer, when people used to come out for the summer, and they'd leave the family out here all week in a rental house mm -hmm. or at the Cedar Shore Hotel, mm -hmm. we had families that came for the whole summer, and they would commute back and forth, but principally on Mondays and Fridays, and, not, and they'd stay in sure. the city during the week. Sure. Uh, so it was a little different right. ball game, and prices right. were, I suppose, cheaper. And so the train was the principal way for those folks to get in and out of Sable and back to the city? Like yeah, if they didn't have cars. Or right. they, I mean, a car trip to the city was, in those days, was, it was not, it was more comfortable to go by train. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, of course, if you opened the windows in the summertime, you got all the coal dust to come in. <laughs> and the seats in those days on the rail were green plush. Mm. So that absorbed all the coal dust. And oh, sure. And you leaned back on them. And <laughs> it's not quite the same. Yeah. Yeah. And there's much more activity along the river, not the ferry boats. Now the ferry boat and its parking lots take up most of the river. Sure. But the ferry boats uh, used to dock further up the river where Steins is now, where that little patio, patio is. And the, the, I think because of the depth of the river, the moving down. I don't remember the trolley they gave that used to run to, to Patchogue and, and North because that was cut out in the mid-20s, or if not before. Mm -hmm. uh, but the buses did run to Patchogue. We used to take the bus to Patchogue occasionally in the movies because yeah. there were three theaters over there. Then the Patchogue Theater, the Rialto, and the Granada. Uh -huh. the choice of Three things. They always got the pictures two weeks before sale. So was Patchogue a pretty established commercial center and a bit of well, a destination? Patchogue and Bayshore. And the ladies, if they went shopping, went to Patchogue or Bayshore. If they really went shopping, they went to Garden City. Patchogue and Bayshore were, were Sweezy's department store in Patchogue. Uh, it was probably a department store for in Lozier's was in Bayshore. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there were others down there. And there were some fancy women's shops, Madame Gurys, uh, that was just for hats, mm. women's hats. And, uh, and the Beehive was another department store in Patcho. Uh, that was uh, a little lower down. Sweezy was a big store. Mm. Of course, my mother worked for Sweezy's, for, she was the buyer for Sweezy's for uh, probably 
20 odd years or more. So she had the, the lingerie, they didn't call it lingerie in those days, the foundations department. The hurricane of 38, uh, I mean, I stayed, we stayed in our house on Handsome Avenue. And there was no water in the cellar. Handsome Avenue, of course, is the, as you may or may not know, is the highest street in South Sable. Okay. And it goes down both directions to the rivers. And uh, it, uh, of course, it buried, a, uh, buried my boat in the sand. It also uh, laid a tree right across our brand new Ford. But actually, in those days, too, that there weren't that many people that suffered for the, the, running around here in cars. Uh, right. We didn't have, the population wasn't that big. Uh, right. They moved in and, and uh, took the trees away, uh, carted them away. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't get the, the bit real drubbing that they got in, in eastern Long Island and up in Rhode Island where they mm. really got under the water. Uh, one, one thing that does strike me about the sale in those days that doesn't happen anymore is Moving houses happen all the time. And uh, Davis Brothers and Blue Point moved all the houses, and I tried to find out from them some of the dates they moved some of the Cedar Shore cottages to number 12 and number 20 Elm Street, originally built right on the shorefront. When they built the new hotel later uh, and enlarged the casino, they were moved up to their present locations that became 12 and 20 Elm Street, 16 Elm Street in between them was built on site, but they were not. Uh, but I tried to find when those houses were built, I think 1916, 17. But building houses was nothing in those days. But, but nowadays, the number of telegraph wires, cable television wires, sure. electric wires and everything makes it pretty expensive expensive to cost things to try and move a house. So picking up and moving a house was not unusual at no. all. Isn't all that amazing? Time. All the time. But just isn't done anymore. Mm -hmm. And was it principally done because something something bigger was going to go to that property, a hotel was going to be built, so a house I was moved? Or what was that, uh, for example, I remember when they moved the house, if you go around Elm Street, mm. Jerry Blaber is on the corner of Handsome Avenue that was the Herbst house in those days and after after they sold it it was a, a, a thing. But anyway the the house directly behind her mm. uh, they felt was too close so they eventually moved it down to the corner of Green Avenue mm. where it still stands today. It's a more Italian house mm -hmm. and, and, and Jerry has a little bigger backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, the two Cedar Shore cottages that sat on the shorefront, we have pictures of those in your collection of mine, uh, were moved up to the north end of the property. Uh, there were other houses, uh, I'm trying to think of examples right offhand, I, I can't, uh, but there were houses that were moved around in Sable and Bayport. Nobody thought they had these big skids they put them on and they just moved them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You wonder why they didn't all fall down when they built them, but they, they were probably better built. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. It's, you know, to just pick up a house and move it is yeah. is a real feat, you know, so it must have been pretty solidly built. But I think the last building I heard of moving, hmm. maybe, it, maybe it was the same with Yacht Club building, maybe it was something more recent, but they floated it from wherever it was uh, to, a, I think it was, I think it was down in Brookhaven somewhere, and they floated it to where it is now in, in Blue Point. As they crossed the street from me, the Simmons Shane property had two rather substantial beach houses. Mm -hmm. Those houses still stand in Cherry Grove. They were taken from there, and they were floated over to Cherry Grove. I'm sure that I, I have, a, have contact uh, with two chaps who owned one of them over mm -hmm. there and who were looking for photographs of them way back when and yeah. they would provide them with a picture of their house when it was uh, down yeah. at the foot of, uh, well really the foot of Benson Avenue. Uh, but uh, moving, 
moving property was, was no problem. Well, the Dickerson house was moved back from Main Street to Center Street, uh, and it's, it's uh, still there. Mm -hmm. uh, the office was just demolished, I guess, finally. Because mm -hmm. uh, I remember old JP, not Charlie, but his father, who used to sit in there with his feet up on the top of the roll top desk. Uh, <laughs> and undercut everybody in town on commissions. He charged five percent, and everybody else tried to charge ten percent. Oh, was unbelievable! There. That was part of it. Uh, the library itself in those days was a very interesting old building, mm. and uh, very dark inside because they left all the original woodwork in it. The children's room was straight through at the back. Uh, I remember Miss Spooner was the librarian. Okay. The one I remember, there were others. Eleanor Half came later. Sure. Uh, but, uh, and she opened, they were, the library was open at certain hours on certain days. It wasn't open 24-7 yeah. uh, or even 8-7 sure. or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and it was quite, quite a different. Uh, and where do you remember that library being? Well, that was where you're original building. Wasn't okay, it? so on Collins Avenue? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was the original Robinson, uh, Robinson Homestead. Or right, so you remember it as the house? Oh, yeah. And that was, the Robinson house was the red one next to it, which eventually burned down. That mm -hmm. was the Edwards house. And I went to Sable High School, which had just been finished in 1926, mm -hmm. and I was the class of 42. Uh, we had a hundred and some odd in the class. Oh, wow. 110, I think. Uh, graduated from Sable High School and uh, went immediately, and I was in June of 42, and went immediately to work that summer in Spring Lake, New Jersey as a waiter, and then on to our science college in the fall. I stayed there for five semesters uh, straight through, including the summer of 43, mm -hmm. and in, in June of 44, mm -hmm. left college to go to the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point. Started there on July 17, 1944. Uh, went to sea for the first time on Thanksgiving Day. We sailed from New York in convoy oh my. for England and uh, on to Antwerp. Uh, we had a nice cargo. Uh, five hatches full of five gallon jerry cans of gasoline. Uh, it was a network for Christmas uh, of uh, catching what were the V-2 rockets in those days. We came back, made two more trips as cadet, one in, in uh, February to Harbin, Rouen in France, mm -hmm. and then one in March to Karachi in Bombay. And I was in Karachi on VE Day, and, and then uh, June came back to the academy and was there for a year and a half, graduated in December of 46, went back to sea as a third mate until the end of 49 mm -hmm. when jobs were getting scarce because the U.S. was laying up all its merchant ships came ashore for a year and a half, didn't really like it. I was working for A.C. Nielsen, it was all right uh, in the drug food audits, but uh, I was working out of Washington in the fall of uh, 51 in the Navy asked for all the volunteers hmm. in the reserve to come back if you wanted to and you'd get your choice of you know, six types of duty. So I dutifully listed the six types of duty I wanted to regular cargo ship, passenger ship, oil tanker, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. And then they called me up and said, we have your orders. And I said, what are they for? And they said, for the Caperton. And I said, what is the Caperton? And they said, that's DD650. I said, what's DD? They said, it's a destroyer. I said, no. Oh. That wasn't exactly what I requested, but I was on the Caperton for two years. Uh, Enjoyed it. We went around in 1953, went around the world. We went from Newport through the Panama Canal and tested the shores of Korea 12 miles off. We a little closer. Mm -hmm. We never admitted to that. <laughs> Did get shelled once by a Japanese plane. 
Uh, yeah. And then came back through Singapore and Suez uh, to the, ended up in Philadelphia. Oh my! And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I went, after that I figured I'd had enough of the sea going for the time and I stayed in the Navy Reserve mm -hmm. for some 23 years and uh, retired as a commander. Wow. And uh, so I still got a little Navy pension. And uh, I, at the same time, I was working mostly in pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I started with Smith Klein French based on. I was, immediately when I got out of the Navy, I went back with Nielsen because I couldn't find anything else right away. Mm. But I was in Philadelphia and I finally got a job with Smith Klein French in 19. 56. Pharmaceutical uh, company then, right? Did, did they eventually right. come become no. Smith Klein Beecham? That's right. Okay. Now they're Glaxo Smith Klein. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed with them for 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> went to join William Cooper in Chicago, which was part of the Burroughs Welcome Group, and there I was selling veterinary products. Uh, but I still was interested in international. Oh, I had some international with Smith Klein. I was, helped him uh, reorganize a company in Mexico, so I was down there for seven months. Wow. Okay. What part of Mexico? Mexico City. But ah. We traveled the country from the northern border to the southern border, uh, looking into it. This was a veterinary company that they had acquired and okay. they needed re, re uh, mm. and, and I came back. Uh, after when I went to William Cooper, that was the veterinary, but those were over the counter products. And then from William Cooper, I got involved with Shearing, Shearing's veterinary group in New Jersey. And I was still trying to get into the international business, so mm. I joined Searle in 1972 as an international product manager. In 73, I became general manager of Searle Pharmaceuticals in Canada. Wow. We, we built a new $5 million plant up there. In 76, I was appointed to be president of Searle in Brazil. We went down there for two years and lived in Sao Paulo. How was that? Uh, we, uh, of course, I had just gotten married. I didn't get married until December of uh, 1976, so, uh, mm -hmm. and we went to Brazil, I married a Canadian wife, Eleanor Ann, who's known as Ann. We went immediately to Brazil before we left Canada. We were so fainted at a cocktail party, and a woman came over and said, oh, oh my dear, I'm so sorry to hear where you're, you're sending you to Brazil, as if we were going to live in a bamboo shack. Right. Uh, we had a very nice house in Sao Paulo. I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> the family house we shared with a Brazilian lawyer and his wife. Uh, and we enjoyed our time down there. We would have stayed longer if given the chance. Sure. But our, my ultimate boss at the time was a chap named Donald Rumsfeld, who some people may know. Uh huh, yes. Donald Rumsfeld at that time was president of Searle, and he had a buddy who had contributed lavishly to his campaigns, and the buddy had a Brazilian wife huh. who wanted to go home after 10 years. So uh, Searle allowed they would find me another job in Chicago, divesting themselves of companies they acquired over the years. But I wasn't too interested in that because I knew that job would only last for about a year. So mm, right. I organized my own little company and I did consulting for the next uh, 20 years or so until I retired entirely, mostly with pharmaceutical and hospital companies and mm -hmm. veterinary companies. And I think that brings us uh, pretty much up to now. Wow. Wow. That is, it's... <laughs> It's diverse. Been you, you, anyway. You've been around the world, time in the service, um, with some major companies. All of the names that you've mentioned are quite and major. In the 30 odd years I've been married, we have traveled extensively too, besides going to Brazil. While we were in Brazil, of course, we went, we had been to both of us, but we went to get to Argentina, we went to Colombia, Peru, all of Brazil, and 
went to Paraguay, so we covered a lot of territory. Now that's that all South America. Um, was there a, a specific thing that brought you, a specific draw that brought you to South America, a particular interest or organization? No, or? it was just since I was heading uh, yep. heading uh, several pharmacy. You had been to Brazil. It was mm -hmm. a good, and we had been to Brazil before. Or I had been to Brazil. We had each been to Brazil, but separately. We decided to see as much of the uh, continent as we could. And Wonderful. And our, Aside from traveling in Brazil, we have since been back to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I have since been back to Brazil, and we have been to Costa Rica, Panama. And of course, I was in Mexico before and after and during. I've been in Mexico many times. My wife is a Canadian, but I perhaps have covered more of Canada than she has. <laughs> <laughs> she was a Canadian. She's now she's a U.S. citizen mm -hmm. for almost 20 years. Yeah. Uh, I think that's about... Uh, now, if we can go back to how... Now, you met your wife while you were in Canada working up yeah, there, right? right yeah. So tell me, how did you So how did you meet her and uh, what was that like? Well, there was a good friend of my mother's mm -hmm. who had a good friend in Canada in Oakville where we lived. Uh, a woman who is now still alive at 103 wow. and doing fairly well and living by herself. Oh, Her parents great. lived, both lived to be more than 100 and she... Wow. Uh, she introduced us. She gave little dinner parties from time to time and I think she thought it would be good to match me up. It was a very snowy night in February. She had set up this party, uh, but actually most people didn't come because mm. of the weather. But I managed to get there, and Anne happened to get there. Uh, uh, we met at her house. We had met before because I'd been in Anne's travel agency attempting to, to book a tr tr travel trip that I had wanted to go to St. Marguerite Island as well, but there wasn't any good way to get there. Uh, so we met again, and uh, she came anyway because she'd been out delivering airline tickets to various customers, and so, you know, we seemed to hit it off. Or, or was Breck, Wilder Breckenridge, she was our, whose home it was, said to his wife afterwards, we seemed to have the proper vibes or something. <laughs> we had the proper vibes, and so we went down to Montreal, the Olympics in April, and then we got married in December. I had already been uh, assigned to <coughs> Brazil as of, as of September 1st, so I was commuting oh my. During, between Toronto and Sao Paulo at the time, and I left her home to, to struggle with the wedding plans. <laughs> Since she'd been married before, she uh -huh. was having a little trouble with the Bishop of Ontario, who oh, dear. thought maybe she should not get married or, or anything, but that finally got itself resolved. Good. And we were married in St. Jude's Church up there in December, and after a honeymoon at the Jersey Shore in December, <laughs> with a little snow and a bottle of rum. And I went on to we went on to Brazil in January, uh, and then uh, as I told you about Brazil, we came back to Seville in 1978, and in 1980 she opened Connie's Lingerie on Main Street, which she ran for 18 years, and mm. she retired in '98. In the meantime, we spent a lot of time traveling, and we I've got a list in my own uh, biography of all the places I was in, the Navy and the Merchant Marine and my travels, and we've added those that we jointly went. And between us, or with, together, we have, over the years, been to cover, pretty well covered Europe, and we have the Far East, and Latin America, and 
Asia, Japan, China, Thailand, Singapore, and Bali, and India. Uh, if I've left it, Africa, we've been to. Oh my. To uh, Morocco and Egypt and Kenya. And years ago, when I was much earlier on, I did go to South Africa and the Virgin Marine, so we covered a few parts of the world. Oh my! Now I, I think you've hit every continent except yeah. Antarctica. That's yeah, and Australia. Well, I've wow. been to Australia. Yeah, you've been to Australia, she right? She's yeah. not been to Australia. Amazing. <laughs> Tell me, out of all of those places, what was what's your favorite, and what has been you and your wife's favorite? Uh, that's pretty hard to say. Ah, we like yeah. them all. I mean, yeah. we like foreign climbs, and we. Yeah, I do too. Uh, mm -hmm. I I think uh, Europe would be the one. We mm -hmm. would, uh, I mean, various places in Europe we would prefer to go back to. Mm -hmm. Africa's interesting, mm. Latin America's interesting, the Far East is the coming part, but it's, but I think Europe is probably the place we would attract us back most mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. Specifically in Europe, that's difficult. Yeah. There's a lot of wow. Care. Good. Amazing. Amazing. Um, gosh. Let's see. How many children do you have? Uh, we, I, we just have a stepdaughter, Victoria. Uh huh. She's Anne's daughter, not mine. Uh huh. Very nice. Very nice. And um, let's see. We talked about your first job. Absolutely. And you, you've held many <laughs> positions. You, you've moved up quite Mostly a bit. marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What out of out of all of those different positions that you've held, what was your favorite position and why? Well, I don't think there's a favorite position, but my job mm. basically always leads me back to market research or okay. research, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm doing now on not only on Sable on the seashore, but on family genealogy, which is not limited to this area. Mm. Uh, it takes me to Illinois, where, Anne's, where in Anne's case, the Masters family originally came from, to Canada, where the Hutchison family. Uh, originally came from, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm getting pretty varied uh, experience doing tracking people and places now. Yeah, yeah, oh my. Um, I'd like to get back to a little bit of, a little bit of Sable as, uh, all right. oh, so did you spend all of your time, you know, have, has your residence always been down by the Cedar Shore? And, uh, yes, well, the Cedar Shore, of the Cedar Shore right. Garden Cottages, I've, I've written in the history of Cedar Shore, right. a brief history that I've written, that there were nine cottages, but actually most of them had a very limited rental uh, history, mm -hmm. because my grandfather, George Alexander Morrison, moved into the one closest to the bay in 1916 after the Powell House, which might recall I mentioned it was, was the original Cedar Shore mm -hmm. House burned down uh, and lived in that too until his death in 31 and his group my grandmother continued to live there until uh, about 1940. My father lived in the second house up from the, from the bay on Handsome Avenue 299. Mm -hmm. uh, so in 299, and then when I came back to Sable in 1979, I bought 277, 279 Handsome, which was a double house, the next one up at the time. And I lived there until 2002, when we moved to about two miles away to the condos in Bayport, mm -hmm. where I live now. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we're, we're still pretty much Sable, I, to, yeah. Right. Participate in community affairs here. Sure. Now, you spent quite a bit of time down in Sao Paulo, and then you came back to, where did you, when you came back from Sao Paulo, where did you end up initially in the States again? Back here at Sable? Well, we came back to Sable for a year and mm -hmm. rented a house, mm -hmm. because my mother was here. We were actually looking up in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Ah, house. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way it finally turned out, we bought 277, 279 because it was adjacent to 12 Elm Street, 
which is one, another of the Cedar Shore cottages where my mother still lives. Ah, okay. And lived until yeah. 1991 when yeah. she died. Yeah. So, uh, and it was adjacent to my aunt's house, 16 Elm Street, which was next to 12, of course. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we didn't get to Fairfield County, we, so we stayed there. Stayed right here. So, yeah. uh, we, well, we lived, uh, as I say, we rented, the year we came back from South Polo, we rented 20 Elm Street, and then I bought 277, 79, and 79, and we had to do a lot of gutting and repairing and remodeling there. Mm. Mm. And then we moved in, in there in, in, uh, that summer, the end of that summer, in September. So. Wow, wow. Uh, that's amazing. That's fascinating. You said you've been involved in quite a bit in, in Sables Affairs and things like that. What are some of the organizations that you've been involved in and things like that? Well, actually, the, the main one, I guess, in Sable is, is the Rotary Club, which uh -huh. my father was a charter member of, uh, which I joined shortly after I came back. Mm -hmm. I did drop out for a year because I was spending a lot of time in Mexico and couldn't right. possibly get to the meetings, but I rejoined when I came back. Uh, and, of course, my major endeavor over the last uh, few years was a hospice care network. Uh -huh. I became a board member of hospice in 1991. Oh, wow. I was in Bayshore. Mm. And I merged with a group in Nassau County. And I stayed as a uh, director on the board of directors until last year, 2001. Oh, wow. When I various reasons I mm -hmm. got out. Right. And uh, the Rotary and Hospice and uh, my work uh, and doing work ad hoc the promotion for the Village Improvement Society and for, to some extent for the Chamber of Commerce wow. back in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, that's kept me along with my job. My Money making side has yeah. <laughs> kept me pretty busy. Uh -huh. Of course, my wife has been an active member of the Chamber of Commerce and president of the Chamber of Commerce during the, the uh, fire, the time of the fires in the mid 90s. This chamber, and we had the fire patrols and all those things. Mm. And she has also been very active in the Village Improvement Society. We have both been president of the Rotary Club, and uh, I've probably forgotten a couple of things. Any interesting stories from Rotary or Village Improvement that you'd want to talk about or not? Uh, I don't know if there's anything really different. I, uh -huh. I wrote at the year that my wife was president, which mm. was 2000, uh, I compiled a pulled together all the Rotary records that I could find going back to 1937 and so sort of synthesized them, if you will, in a book, which the library has a copy of, uh, you know, pretty much takes you th through the history of Rotary and the presidents all the way from 1937 to 2000. Uh, if I ever get time and get energy, I will write an addendum to it uh, from mm -hmm. 2000 to 2010. We've got all the records because I've maintained all the archives the last 10 years or so, and they're all in the library here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that keeps Rotary up to date. I've watched it change a little bit. Uh, the Beef State, for example, used to be a great golf day and it ended up with the beef steak. Ah, okay. They, that got to be too much in the, uh, I guess it was in the mid uh, 80s or so. Okay. And they cut the two apart. The beef steak was one thing, a fundraiser, mm -hmm. open to the public, and the golf day was a little separate. Uh, actually, so many golf days that we don't even have golf days any, right. anymore. <laughs> Too many in competition. 
the, I suppose the main event of Rotary, the main change over the years has been the admission of women in, to our local club in 1991. Mm. And there were five females that were brought in by Mike Kosichuk at once, so one wouldn't be pinpointed as the uh, as the one to try and get rid of. <laughs> I, I can't think of anything specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you recall the, the five women that were inducted at once? Well, it was my wife, yep. Betty Whitehouse, mm -hmm. Pam Raymond, mm -hmm. Marilyn Triola, and there was uh, Libby Westerbeek. Mm. Wow. And okay, great. The, all, all prominent sable folks that we often have seen here at the library and uh, some have been already uh, participating well, in our has retired to Florida or something. Right. Right. The yeah. rest are all still here. Yeah.